What's up, everybody? It's the Welcome to the Show podcast brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show to get a free audio book download and a 30 day free trial. That's audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show. The Welcome to the Show podcast is independently produced by me and my buddy CT. Help people find our show by taking two minutes to leave a five star rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps people to find our show. CT, happy trade deadline, yeah. man. Yeah, it was wild. It was man. it was wild. Yes, it was. I so this is the first year that I'm doing the trade deadline with Call to the Pen as an editor. And I'm going to say that from from like one ish until four, it was just nonstop. Like my fingers hurt. My brain hurts. My brain still hurts. Uh, what were you doing? Updating? What were you updating? Just like a. So I was just on Twitter, comment, th- commenting on Twitter. And then our we have a crop of writers right now. So we, we were we went through a down period there for a few months. And over the last couple of weeks, we've gotten a couple of writers that are really active and um they were just cranking shit out man like like the the granky trade was executed and this dude had a piece ready in like 30 minutes so i was just like waiting constantly and just posting right away um so i mean the site's been doing well over the last couple days but yeah this trade deadline was an experience a different experience for me because it was just non-stop like usually i'll just keep up on my phone i got the bleacher report notification or whatever this year, you know, I was like, holy shit, this is insane. Like, I can't even imagine what it's like for the, for the, you know, like the Ken Rosenthal's or the, the Jeff Passes yeah. of the world. You know what I mean? No, yeah, definitely an experience this year, especially this was the first year they don't have the waiver loophole yeah. thing going on. I still never figured out how that worked, and I'm actually kind of glad it's gone because I didn't want to sit there and read through all this of how this waiver stuff works in baseball. Right. But uh, it was kind of boring literally until the bauer trade yesterday yeah um i don't know if you i don't know if you want to just get right into it but yeah man i feel like deadlines it's a good thing in in, in nba when there's a deadline or in the nfl when there's a deadline it's it, it felt kind of like that maybe not on that magnitude like maybe not that many people were tuning in but i felt like for baseball fans it was definitely an interesting moment when bauer went to the reds totally unexpected like yeah. it was the most unexpected thing i don't think that, was there anybody out there that thought that would happen? Like, you know? Yeah. Well, th- that's the thing is is that well now aside from the Granky deal, and we're gonna talk about the big trades. I don't want to talk about you know the the A yeah. level pitcher that the Yankees got from the Rockies. I don't even know what the fuck the point of that was. But anyway, we'll get into that later. But we're gonna we're gonna break down all the big trades, um, and then later on you can skip ahead, read the episode description if you don't want to hear baseball talk. We're gonna talk about a couple of movies later on. Um, so go ahead and, and uh, skip ahead if that's what you want to do. But anyway, what I found odd was the Marcus Stroman trade and the Trevor Bauer trade. They're, they're both going yeah. to losing teams. The Mets are 11 games behind the, in the NL East, and they're five games behind in the wild card. The Cincinnati Reds are seven and a half games behind in the NL Central and six and a half games behind in the wild card. Usually pitchers like that, of that magnitude, they go to contenders. So I'm surprised... That that's what happened. We came to learn uh, late, uh, later on in the day. I think it was Mark Feinstein reported that the Mets wanted to flip um, Stroman over to the Yankees, but they were asking for Davy Garcia, and I think it was Estevan Florial. If I were the Yankees, I would have I would have done it. Yeah, because I'm like, first of all, I think it's crazy how the Mets that was the Mets' uh, motive, right? Yeah, I think. It's funny, like everybody was split on that trade, and I'm coming to find out the Mets' real reason for trading for him was to flip him. I don't know how Marcus Stroman would feel about that, but I, I don't know where I read this. Something about him being upset that he was going to the Mets, or his dad was upset about it, or yeah. that he thought he would he would go to a contender. But I'm really impressed that the Mets' real reason for getting him was to flip him to the Yankees, which I think the Yankees definitely wanted Marcus Stroman. But then I started thinking. The Mets gave up two prospects I never heard of, two pitching prospects yeah. I haven't heard of yet. So what could the Yankees not have made a better offer to the Blue Jays, something more worth it? And back to what you said, yeah, I would have definitely made that that deal with the Mets, I yeah. think. 
to to what you were talking about before. So what happened with the Stroman thing was when when the trade went down after the the Blue Jays game was over, there was a commotion in the Blue Jays clubhouse and they closed the cl they closed the clubhouse to reporters. And it came out later that Marcus Stroman was unhappy with the way the Blue Jays handled the trade. He thought that he would be traded to the Astros or the Yankees or the Red Sox. Um, and then later it came out that, that Stroman's dad said that, that Stroman thought he would be a Yankee and not a Met. Um, and then Stroman came out later on and said that he was disappointed with the way the trade was handled, but that it has nothing to do with the Mets, that he's happy that he's going, that he's going back home to New York and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Yankees are in a position right now where none of their starters have an ERA under four, not even Domingo Herman. Um, their starters can't go the distance. Um, they didn't add, they didn't even add to their bullpen, which is, has been taxed at this point. What are they going to look like in October? Um, yep. I don't know, man. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not so upset that the Astros got Granky because the Yankees had no chance of getting Granky. He had a no trade clause to the Yankees. He wasn't going to go to New York. Yeah. But how do we know? How do we know he wasn't going to go to New York? Cause it's just because of, of what he's. Because what he said, like five, six years ago, whatever, whatever time it was about the pressure or something, you yeah. think that's why? I mean, I don't know. Until until we hear that, I don't think that I'm not gonna think that it was Granky's. Like, no, I'm not going to the Yankees. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's an accident that he was traded to a team that he didn't have a no trade clause to. You know what I mean? He couldn't block that trade. So to me, that indicates that. Well, clearly the Astros have amazing prospects. So the the uh, the Diamondbacks got three big time prospects out of the Astros. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if the Yankees could have matched that. I mean, the Yankees could have given them Davy Garcia, another you know Estevan Florial. They might have wanted maybe someone like Miguel Andujar, but I don't know. I don't know if he would have done that. It doesn't seem to me like he wants to pitch in a, in a big market like New York. He didn't want to stay in Los Angeles when he was there. When it was it was him and, and uh, Kershaw, the one two punch. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, man, but the Astros now, they have the one, two, and three ranked in whip pitchers. Uh, I think it's Garrett Cole has a one or something. Verlander and Zach Greinke rank one, two, and three in whip. I, I think it's one, two, and Cole's like fifth, I think. Oh, is he? Okay. I think that's what I saw, but still, regardless, <laughs> I didn't, that's I didn't insane. need to, I didn't, I didn't need to know their rankings in whip to know if Verlander and Cole alone is a problem for playoff yeah. for a playoff matchup in any series well Verlander alone because he he's gonna go seven innings plus but now with Zach Greinke I mean to me it's Verlander one Greinke two Cole three um yeah but back to the Marcus Stroman thing with the uh with the Mets and the Yankees this guy Garcia right Davey Garcia the first yeah. time I yeah, the first time I heard of him, I understand he's been making his way through the ranks, but the first time I heard of him was kind of, you know, May or June, maybe? I yeah. don't know, beginning June. And I feel like there's something to that. Like, it almost, I almost wouldn't put it past Brian Cashman for, like, maybe taking up this guy's value. I understand he's doing amazing in, in the minors. Well, I'm actually looking at the numbers right now. He has a 1.5 whip, which is okay at the triple a level so his numbers got a little bit worse at the triple a level yeah um, i think he's i don't he's, think i think he's been pushed up in this year i think he went from a to triple a yeah and all his numbers his numbers are up from what he was doing on his way to triple a so i i wouldn't i wouldn't be i wouldn't think it's crazy for a team to ask for him and not think it's a big deal like he's like this like untouchable prospect Mm -hmm. And back to you know with Florio, where is he gonna like? When is he going? Where is he going to play? And when is he going to play? Florio, what about Clint Frazier? We saw that. We yeah. see that. We see like, that Clint Frazier's MLB ready. His defense isn't good, but he has a good where, bat. And yeah. you keep bringing up Mike Talkman. You bring up everybody but Clint Frazier since that outburst. So what are you gonna do with this kid? Is he is he just gonna rot in, in the minors? You know what I mean? Like, and the fact that uh, the Braves, I think it was the Braves, got a uh, Shane Green. From the Tigers, yeah, I feel like the Yankees could have gotten Shane Green. I mean, they could have yep. given up one of the, just one of the prospects. Shane Green is like the top three closer in, in American League this year, and he was pitching for the the Tigers. Yeah, so he's converted. I think he's converted all but two of his opportunities for saves. So yeah, I would have definitely made that Stroman trade just off the fact that 
Aaron Hicks is there for another six years. You got Aaron Judge, and then you got Giancarlo wow. Stan. So where, you know, where's, where Whoops. is Florio supposed to play? Line with the pencil. Um, I agree with you. My bad. There's some ads playing. I hate websites okay. like. That yeah, play no, ads. The same thing happened to me before, but mine isn't coming through the recording. So. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> they got uh, and the Nats picked up three different relief pitchers today too so there were arms to be got the tanner rourke was was just given away to to the a's not that he's gonna make a difference or whatever but he's another arm i'm hearing that when severino comes back that he's gonna pitch out of the bullpen not out of the rotation i don't know Mm -hmm. i don't know what this team is thinking maybe they're thinking that they could bullpen their way through the postseason um i actually wrote an article last week about how maybe the solution for the team is to just use openers um because if if you follow if you follow the rule of the opener to the T, the idea is, as you know, CT, a lot of people don't talk about this. I don't know why. But the idea is that you're combating high scoring in the first inning. And that's been the Yankees' Achilles heel this season, is that they give up way too many runs in the first inning. And when they have an opener, their ERA drops, you know, exponentially, and they're also undefeated. I think they're ten and zero or eleven and zero when they use openers. So why not just keep, you know, keep uh, uh, this guy, Chad Green, as your opener on days that James Paxton and maybe CeCe Sabathia pitches because James Paxton cannot get out of the first inning. I don't know why. And then, yeah. you know, Domingo Herman, Masahiro Tanaka, they have the, they can go the, they can go the distance. They, you know, they've shown that they can pitch deep into games and such. And maybe that'll remedy your your problems. And then when Sevi comes back, if you want to throw him in the bullpen, I would make him a starter because, I mean, if Sevi isn't our ace, then what the hell have we been doing with this guy? Why did we give him ten million dollars a year when when <laughs> he's probably going to get less in arbitration at this point? It's um, crazy. Ten million year, ten million year does not seem like a bad deal at this point, right? Like if no. Sevi doesn't turn out to be anything, now we're like, damn, yeah. ten million a year. This guy's That's making ten million dollars yeah. for six, whatever years, and. But at the time, you, we were all saying, you know, he's underpaid because what other guys are making. Like, look, look well, at what Evaldi got. Evaldi got like 15, right. 17 a year. And, and the, so. the frustrating part is that you're seeing teams all around you getting better. You saw the, the Braves uh, upgraded their bullpen. The Nationals are surging right now. I think they have possession of, of a wild card slot. Um, so they upgraded their bullpen. You saw the Astros were looking for a starter. They went out. They went out and got a starter. The uh, who who else made moves today? Um, we're talking about just pitchers, or are we talking anything? In, in any regard, the Cubs got themselves another bat in, in Nick Castellanos. Um, moves were made, Scooter, and the, Scooter Jeanette, Scooter Jeanette to the, goes to, to the, the San Giants. Francisco Giants. Yeah, um, like and one. then you have the Yankees. Who I don't know what the fuck is going on with all the injuries. It's starting to get a little creepy at this point. But you just lost Luke Voigt. He's probably going to have surgery. Who knows when he's going to come back. Giancarlo Stan has only played like maybe seven games this year. Um, you don't have any pitching. Severino's in the in the IL. But Tances is on the IL. You you didn't. I, it's not even that they didn't get Greinke or that they didn't get Robbie Ray or they didn't get um, um, uh, Mike Miner or whoever, Syndergaard or Bauer or Stroman. It's that I, I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I'm starting to think, what is the point of holding on to guys like Esteban Florial, Clint Frazier, even this Davy Garcia? At this point, what is the point? You're you're the closest you've been in ten years to a World Series. It's now it's now or never at this point. What if Davy Garcia doesn't pan out? What if Clint Frazier, you know, breaks his hip or some shit? I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's you getting know, frustrating. We're we're never. I don't think we're ever gonna know what the Yankees were being offered or what they were being asked for in these trades or not. But you got to think they could have at least gotten Trevor Bauer. I mean, do you see how how this this played out? I'm looking at it. I don't even know what what the point of it was. Like Yasiel Puig and Framio Reyes, Reyes go to <laughs> go to Cleveland. They also get Logan Allen. I mean, Framio Reyes still has yet to pan out. Yasiel Puig is 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 like the perfect baseball player, but never plays like one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like the Yankees could have definitely outbid whatever the hell was getting offered for Trevor Bauer, unless the or, Indians as, just wanted to Stroman. piss him off I mean, and be like, "Enjoy, enjoy." How about Marcus yeah, yeah. Stroman? He pitches in the AL East. He knows, you know, he knows the competition. 
He's a young kid. He's from New York. He wants to play with the Yankees. And all you have to give up to get him is Esteban Florial and Davey Garcia, who, like you said, has only been in the minds of Yankees fans for the last two months. And when Omar Minaya went to scout him for the Mets, you knew that the Mets wanted him because Omar Minaya fell in love with him. He called him Little Pedro or some shit like that. So we have no you could have sold high on this kid. He's he's a short kid. Yeah, like I, I don't know. And that's what I'm saying, that we'll never know what was offered in any of these trades. But I got to think that if, like, it's always been that you have a good, you have pieces in your farm system. You're in the position to win a a, a World Series. You overpay. Everybody overpays. Like, I don't understand why Cashman has to, you know, hold himself to a new standard. I mean, you can only make so many good moves. I think people already give him a lot of credit for what he's done. Like, let's not, let's not yeah. downplay what he's been able to do. The Yankees never went through, like, a dark times rebuilding year since I've been alive. You know, their rebuilding Preach. year was the was the year that A Rod. <laughs> a Rod. If you're listening to this out there, man, just, I know you probably saw all of this coming. <laughs> like you saw Trevor yeah, Bauer right. going to the Reds. But uh yeah, like that was supposed to be the rebuilding year. And it wasn't it wasn't a losing season. I think you guys were like eighty eight and whatever. And uh the next year you guys go to the ALCS, you know, like it's <sighs> yeah. I think like I just think I don't understand. Why wouldn't you overpay for anything? You know, load up on on a dish, get six starting pitchers. Have be the one team with six starting pitchers and a great bullpen. You know, you never know. Yeah. Um, it. I just feel like you have Judge. You're not paying Judge. You're not paying Gary Sanchez. You're not paying Gleyber Torres. He's young and and ripping it. Judge has had a whole half a season to rest. Gary Sanchez is gonna come back with a month left. You got to think that. Uh, you know, fatigue isn't going to be an issue. Maybe for your bullpen, now that I'm thinking about it, right? They've been getting used a lot. Mm-hmm. But fatigue is not going to be an issue for your lineup. Like, stack up on pitching. And it's like you said, a bunch of relief pitchers moved. There was a lot of relief pitcher action. Yep. People went out and just got the guys that were out there. And I know Mark Melanson isn't like this, what he was on the Pirates, you know, before you signed that humongous yeah. deal. But he's still like a solid relief pitcher, you know? Yeah. So... Yeah, and and um, like I said before, next year Brett Gardner is probably not going to be here. So you have one position in the outfield that's open for someone. It's either going to be Estevan Florial or it's going to be Clint Frazier. It can't be both of them unless if Aaron Hicks goes down. But Aaron Hicks has proven that he's he you know he's a good bat in in tough situations and he plays a good center field. Aaron Judge is is he owns right field for as long as he needs to. So you're going to have Esteban Florial and Clem Frazier. They're just sitting there. You're going to have to move them at some point. You can't just let them sit and rot in, in, in the minors. Um, yeah, man. I, it just it, To me, it just doesn't make sense to hold on to these guys. Maybe maybe there's a trade in the offseason at this point, but players can't move anymore. So what Brian Cashman said to his to, to the Yankee fan base today is that we have the, we have the World Series championship team already on the field and i right now i just don't buy it i don't think that this team is is there yet i think that we had the mojo for a long time and i think that the i don't want to use excuses but i think the injuries are going to start getting to this team at some point the injuries are going to start hurting this team when you have 20 some odd players in the il it has to hurt you at some point the starters are not cutting it and you're gassing the shit out of your bullpen um so you know i don't know I'm thinking about it though, like just to be fair, just to play like both sides of it. it we think Severino's coming back. I don't think he's coming back. I don't think he's going to pitch know. in the playoffs. Uh, and then you got Batantas, hopefully coming back. So that is kind of like trade acquisitions and stuff it like is. that that you can make. And Stan coming back would be like you got Stan in a trade or whatever. But still, but how do we even know with those are even with stay on the Batantas, field? Yeah, even yeah, exactly. Even with Batantas, even with Stan, even with um, Severino all back. What what happened over the weekend against the Red Sox, right? Like, no starting pitcher besides Domingo Herman, which we don't know what he's going to be like in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. None of those starting pitchers performed the second start in the playoff series. So even if you did get Severino back, I still think you need another pitcher. Even if you got Potentis back, I still think you needed that other uh, bullpen arm. And it just sucks, like, you got spoiled teams like the Yankees with all these prospects, can't make a move, and you got... Us Red Sox fans over here, we don't we don't have, we didn't really have a choice. Nobody wanted our shit. Nobody wanted what we have in the minor. <laughs> Did you read that report? That that uh that tweet? 
I forget who it yeah, was. I think, I th- I th- <laughs> but that yeah, the Red like Sox we, didn't you know, want <laughs> We would have had to do something stupid, so stupid, which yeah. they probably would have been like give up Devers and Xander Bogarts or something. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, Damn that's it. the thing is, is that you your your bats can if your bats can come together at the same time like they did last weekend against the Yankees, you guys can outscore any team, even the Astros with that one two three punch. You guys can outscore any yeah. team in this league easily, but you know that's not always going to happen. So that's I think that's why we're seeing the Red Sox have like these super highs this year and then they have these like insane lows because they're not all clicking at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why you can't have any weaknesses on a team because the day that you guys lose because you guys didn't come through with your bats, but your bats come through the next day, but then that's the day your pitcher didn't come through. You know, any right. little thing to throw that win off or to make it a win into a loss or, or vice versa, like you can't have any of these weaknesses. I don't remember the last World Series team that one with the quality of pitching that the Yankees have, you know? Right, right. With with Tanaka was your first game starter, and now he's turned into the complete opposite of how he started the first half of the season. So I've never seen a team win a World Series like that. I don't know. I'm hoping that, that by some miracle that James Paxton finds it at some point. I hope that when Sevi comes back, that he pitches like Severino. I hope that when Bat- Batances comes back, he can hit. He can pitch like Batances. I hope that when Giancarlo Stanton comes back, that he can rake. <laughs> I just hope that it all at some point clicks. It's been clicking for us. I can't complain. We're, we have, I think, the best record in the American League. Um, but I've been I've, saying this for a while now. I just, I don't know. I, something doesn't feel right about this team. Everybody's gonna come back and click. Because tell me how Gary Sanchez and Luke Voigt go down, and now Austin Roman out of nowhere knows how to hit home runs like four hundred foot home runs. <laughs> four hundred foot home runs, like oh, <laughs> he's man. the difference maker now in, t- in in the Yankees game. Like, come on, man! Like Talkman and and uh, Urshela, Urshela's back to being on fire. Like it's just like when everybody came back, Urshela kind of yeah. declined a little bit to his yeah. more normal self. People go right back on the IL. He's back to can't make this shit up. I love it, man. Keep talking. Keep talking, man. I want to hear. It. I think I've talked. I think I've. I think I've talked enough. Oh, okay. All right. Real quick, let's get into. So, so yesterday was it yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday. The Trevor yesterday. Bauer deal, and during the Trevor Bauer deal, there's a. A uh, freaking brawl, and I I don't think I've ever seen a brawl like this one before. I've seen a pitcher charge the batter. I've seen the Marischal ch- tape when he when when he went after the pitcher or somebody went after him with a ba- with a baseball bat. I've seen Pedro knock Don Zimmer on his ass. Um, I've classic, never classic, seen a classic. pitcher run into the opponent's dugout. And start throwing haymakers. I've never seen that shit yeah. before. That shit yeah, was man, that just, was crazy. It was classic, man. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we all know it started with the whole Dietrich thing, right? In the beginning of the year with Chris Archer. Yeah. I mean, isn't it? They. I don't know. Did the teams do anything to squash that beef? Because that that's that was like in May or April or something. <laughs> that was well, a long that, time ago. So when I was watching the post game interviews, the Cincinnati Reds' manager, I can't remember who it is off the top of my head right now, he was talking about how the Pirates have been throwing at Reds hitters all season and that nothing has been done about it. He says that after after a Pirates pitcher throws at a Reds hitter, warnings are issued and, and his team can't protect his players. And he said basically that it was going to be a matter of time before somebody takes it upon their own hands and um and deals with it and it seems like yesterday when when D, when they threw at Dietrich I think it was at his head um Amir Garrett took offense to it and he decided to protect his teammates by running to the opponent's fucking bench and uh and starting a fight and apparently Votto right before that Votto had been talk had been shouting into the Pirates um dugout saying like you know you guys can throw at us that's fine but don't throw at our heads and they were getting into a little verbal match which when Votto starts to get involved in shit you know something in my opinion he's not he's not he's not the fighting type of player um something is up there um and it's you know that's what it seems like to me I mean 
I don't I don't know how I feel. I feel like I agree that if 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 one of your players get gets plunked, the umpire shouldn't issue a warning immediately. They should give the, the opposing team an opportunity to respond, and then the warning should be issued. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I don't know how yeah. you feel about that. No, I agree. I uh, I totally agree with not issuing a warning, and I've seen. I remember I saw one the other day where a guy threw a curveball, just got away from him, and he was issued a warning. That's or insane. he was thrown out of the game, actually. I think he was actually thrown out of the game. And oh, even yeah, the yeah. Justin it, Turner. It was Justin Turner yeah. was a hitter. And he and the yeah, Turner yeah. was actually standing up for the pitcher. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think the pitcher got thrown out of that game. It wasn't even a warning. Yeah, he and did. And the, the Dodgers must have been up by, like, 10 at that point. Yeah. It must have been or something. So, you know, it wasn't intentional. Like, I don't know. Uh, that whole Pirates and Reds thing, that was pretty dangerous, though. Like, it reminded me of... Like that Armando Benitez <laughs> fight back in the day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when he was on yes. the Orioles, that was a classic. That one was one. crazy. That yeah. one was probably the craziest brawl I've ever seen. Like on tape. that was yeah. I forgot about that. Daryl Strawberry like was in the other dugout. Like literally, he was throwing punches closed, in the other dugout. Yeah, he like clotheslined him like out of nowhere. But <laughs> man, that was, <laughs> such a street uh, move. What, what's it called? Uh, back back to the Reds and the Pirates, right? Like every time a brawl comes up in conversation i always think like yeah that was it shouldn't be like that but at the same time you kind of love it as a fan like that's part of baseball i feel like it's one of the it's something that baseball has over the nba and football when things like that happen in the nba and football it usually never escalates to a a big thing but in baseball it's like 40 guys (laughs) from both sides yeah running from the bullpen and everything so i always feel like it's exciting to see those brawls but you never want to see a guy get his head bashed in you might you pretty just want you pretty much just want to see the benches clear and people scuffle around and everything. So as much as I'm against that, what happened yesterday, it was exciting, you know, <laughs> like it was exciting. And, and, um, I bet MLB network got a lot of readings out of it because they were playing the replay over and over and over and <laughs> over and over again. And CT, you made a good point before we got on CT was talking about how much it, re- it resembles WWE and um, so we got some sound to we got some sound to play for you guys, so you, and and we want to compare what Major League Baseball announcers sound during a brawl to a WWE matchup. So CT, when, whenever you want me to stop the audio, just let me know. All right, <laughs> here we go. After a few ejections had already occurred, and here comes Amir Garrett. He's leaving the mound. He wants a piece of somebody. Amir Garrett takes a swing and gets a punch. The Pirates bench is emptied. And punches Amir are Garrett being went thrown. flying, and they are hitting each oh. other punches all over the big. place. This is not This usually. is a real fight. And it continued. <laughs> <laughs> all right, keep playing it. This keep playing it. Wait, keep playing it. <laughs> oh, there's more. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. For a good five minutes. Hey, look, 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 right here, right here. Look, look, look. Oh. oh, now we got Quig taking that. Quig wants Crick, but Crick wants nothing to do with him. No. Kyle Crick the... wants nothing to do with <laughs> him. And this is when the Undertaker music comes on. Boom. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, my God, God the Undertaker. Like... Yeah, Puig, Puig, had, Puig wants Crick. Crick wants something to do with him. <laughs> oh my like the, God. the other guy couldn't even keep up. The other oh guy, the, the Susan Waldman version of that the crew. <laughs> Could not could not keep up like with with what was going on, uh, and I realized like I never heard I just realized I never heard John Sterling, you know, call a brawl, a fight, call a yeah, brawl. I don't yeah, think I, have, brawl. I haven't either. All right, now here's here's a WWE comparison. So yeah, I Man, mean that's crazy. That guy was waiting this. for that guy was waiting for a brawl to happen. The guy from the uh, MLB radio, or I don't know yeah, if yeah. that was Cincinnati Reds radio or the Pirates radio, but that guy was just waiting, or he knows he's he's done WW before. Or he sits by his TV, watches WWE with the volume off, and he does it himself. That's that's my theory, CT. That's my conspiracy I have, theory. I have a I have a friend that does that. Yeah, so. <laughs> really? I, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, for me, the biggest takeaway here is the Houston Astros are now 
the hands down favored to win the World Series again. Hopefully not. Nothing is guaranteed. We don't know what's going to happen in the next two months of baseball. We've seen teams defeat squads with with really good pitching staffs in the past. The 2015 New York Mets, the Dodgers. We saw the 2001 Oakland A's uh, when they had Barry Zito, Tim Hudson, and Mulder, I think his name was. Um, We've seen it in the past. It can happen again. Um, Now... The Houston Nationals have a big target on their back, and everybody's going to show up when it's when it's Houston Nationals time. People are going to show up, so um, we'll see what they're made of moving forward. Another thing we learned is the New York Yankees feel like they have the squad to win a World Series, but their fans don't agree. I don't agree. Uh, the Boston Red Sox don't have the pieces to make any deals. <laughs> and I have one more okay. question, and I don't know if you have anything else on the trade deadline, but I have one more question. With the Yankees failing to execute a trade for Marcus Stroman from the Mets, do the Mets have the best pitching staff aside from the Zach Greinke deal? Do they have the best the best pitching staff in the National League? You got Jacob Degrom, Noah Syndergaard, Marcus Stroman, no. Zach Wheeler, Steve Matz. I'm gonna go with Clayton Kershaw, He Jun Ryu, mm. and Walker Buehler. Okay. Those three. I mean, I when I when I think of, I guess you can make the argument that the Mets have the best five. But Definitely. again, Matt's like Matt's is up and down. Yeah. Noah Syndergaard has been pitching good as of late, but he's all right. So I wait. So uh, I knew you. I knew you were gonna say that about Syndergaard, and I agree. Oh God! I have, don't, I, don't. I have him on my fantasy team. I have him on my fantasy team, and I agree because I've seen it with my own two eyes. But a a playoff game. You're the Boston Red Sox. You're about to face Noah in the Garden game two of the series, and you lost game one. You're not a little bit nervous? I'm nervous, but I'm not like I, let me let me I'll explain to you what kind of nervousness I am. It's like facing it's like facing Tanaka. I'd be I'd be more afraid to face Tanaka than Noah in the Guard today. Wow. Really? Yeah. And I'm just I'm just saying that. Noah Syndergaard, when he blew up as a Met pitcher his first, second year, whatever it was, when they went to the World Series, yeah. to me it was like if it wasn't for DeGrom on, being on that team, he'd be the sec- the best pitcher without a doubt on that team. He's an ace. He's almost like the second ace on a team, right? Right yeah. now, there's, he would be the ace on the Yankees maybe. He wouldn't be the ace on the Red Sox. That says a lot. Uh, there's a lot of teams he wouldn't be the ace for. I feel like when he pitched well in his career when his second first year whatever it was uh you could have made the argument you know either him or DeGrom on any given day and now it's like even if DeGrom wasn't on that team would he would he really still be the ace so to me I'm not as afraid to face Noah Syndergaard game two as like I would have been Hmm. that's just me though I I don't know I just think he's he's a strikeout pitcher when he's on like when he's on he's on I'm, as a matter of fact, if the Red Sox play Noah Syndergaard, we might win by ten. Damn! Wow, that's he can't geez. he can't he can't he can't hold runners on. And what do we okay. do best? Yeah, you're aggressive. We're you're savages. Aggressive. You're aggressive. We're on the savages base. on that. We're savages on the base path. Oh wow, wow! You're gonna take that <laughs> term, huh? Okay. All right. <laughs> anyway, so okay, I I do think that the Mets have the best pitching staff in the National League, one to five. I agree that okay. if it's the Mets, Dodgers, and the ALCS, that I take – well, I take the Grom over Kershaw now. I don't take the Grom over Kershaw for their careers. I take – I think I take Syndergaard over Ryu. And Ooh, I think I why? take we. I think I take Wheeler – no, I don't take Wheeler over Bueller. I take Bueller over Wheeler. No, you're right. You're right. Syndergaard, Syndergaard over Ryu, really? Yeah, man. One guy walks one, – one guy walks five batters a game. The other guy walks five batters and ten starts. Yeah, but one guy takes the ball off the field, you know, for half the outs. He can strike out 11 batters in the game. That's not half the outs. Two, a third of the outs. All right, man. That's all, that's all, I'm, that's all I'm saying. I think Syndergaard's overrated. I like think I, like that I've he's... Like for a while now. I, I, I don't think he's overrated. But I also don't think that people think that Noah Syndergaard is... Uh, like a top five pitcher in baseball, I think he's I a think top, that I think he's a top ten pitcher in baseball, top fifteen. I think that I think that if the Mets, I think a guy like 
Noah Syndergaard would net a better return than Zach Greinke would have, than Justin Verlander did whenever he got traded. Yeah, but I think um, that's because of age. I don't think it's because of stuff. Like, like Age control uh, and stuff. Zach, Zach Greinke's 35 years old. Noah Syndergaard is... How old is Noah Syndergaard? He's young still. Okay, well, when Justin Verlander got traded, he was still older. I get it. Let me think of a better example. Uh, there's just not too many... That's why I'm saying that as... As overrated as I think Syndergaard is, I think the Mets should have traded him based off of how that I do think he's overrated, which I think they th- on some level also think he's overrated because he's nothing like he was when they went to the World Series. Nothing close to that right now. Uh, he walks a lot of batters. He high pitch count all the time, gets to the bullpen early. But I think the whole league notices that it's a 26, 28-year-old, however old he is. And that he throws 100 and all this stuff. He's pitched in the World Series. I think the, the rest of the league sees the value. So they could have gotten anybody's. They could have cleaned out anybody's farm system with, yeah, with yeah. Syndergaard. Still here's, think he's overrated, though. Here's my hot take. I think Noah Syndergaard, to me, resembles Verlander at the same age. I just think Verlander. he's not a he's not a seasoned pitcher yet. I think to put him in the Astros and... I, the joke with me is that the Astros turn and like like they picked up Aaron Sanchez. They got a, they traded for Aaron Sanchez, and I tweeted that Aaron Sanchez just revamped his his career with that trade because they know how to fix a pitcher. But um, put put Verlander on the Yankee, um, Syndergaard on the Yankees, for example. I think he'd learn to pitch better. I think I don't I, the, the Mets organization just doesn't do it for me. I am so glad that you brought up Yankees, Noah Syndergaard going to the Yankees. I meant to ask you a question. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Okay. It, it relates to kill the win. Oh, boy. You see where I'm going with this? All right. You see how the Yankees are a top three team in, in the in the uh, MLB, and their offense is definitely top three? Mm-hmm. You see those starting pitchers? Yeah, but, but uh, you're proving my point. Wait, what, do they have bad do they do they have bad win loss records? Pitch, none of those they have average win loss records. None of those pitchers are getting twenty okay, wins. Okay, well look at someone like Edwin Rodriguez. Do what you about consider him? He he has the highest run support in baseball. Look at his record. Eduardo Rodriguez. Eduardo Rodriguez. I don't okay. I don't choose to remember shitty pitchers' names. No, 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 no. You're, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I know what Yankees you're trying to say. Great. You're trying to say that the Yankees have the best record in the American League. And, that and they pitchers, give a lot of runs. Support yeah, well. they score a lot of runs and that their pitchers don't have. Still insane, can't get like, a, good, a good win. They're loss not like 10 and 0 because, you know, because whatever. I know what you're trying to not, say. Because they're not pitching well is the point. The point is you can see a correlation of good pitching with wins and losses. You can make I, an assumption I agree, that and good I, pitches. I've always agreed That's with that. That's all I was trying to say. I've always agreed with that. But my point is that you can see a, a even better correlation to run support to what how much a team scores and a player's record than how well a pitcher pitches and his record. I think there's a bet there's a bet it's it's more indicative. God, I can't believe we're talking about this shit again. <laughs> Listen, how a whatever. Player's, how a player's how a pitcher's offense plays plays a bigger role in his record. Try to stay away from pitchers that had DeGrom's type of season, which is be very rare to find another one that had his situation of last year where he pitched lights out every game and the Mets never gave him run support. But pick any other pitcher in the history of the game and tell me the correlation. Your your chart doesn't measure um, run support. Make the same chart, but use run support to, to find a correlation. I can use run support. I can use any pitcher for anything. When they won the game, when they pitched for the win, their numbers are Hall of Fame numbers compared to when they pitched for the loss, which is you're not even you're not a major league pitcher. You're so, you're a major league troll, man. You know that? <laughs> All right, man. I just think That's it's funny. Like. Yankees, you, you got the point. <laughs> On to the I got the side. point. The next topic was actually your topic, the for uh, viewership. Want to talk about that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, MLB local viewership is down 4% this year. And that includes a shocking drop by the Yankees. The Yankees are down 26%. 
And at the time when I saw this article, they had the best record, I think, behind the Dodgers. Mm. And they have the best for first place in the AL East. So viewership is local viewership is down. Manny made a good point before. Manny, if you want to give your reason for why you think views are down. Yeah, so so it is first off, it's troubling that that local viewership is down four percent because baseball is a regional sport. I think that guys like CT are the exception in Major League Baseball that he roots for the Boston Red Sox, even though he lives in in New Jersey and New York. Typically, if you're you know you root for the team that's within your region, so to see that that local viewership is down is troubling. To see that the New York Yankees, who are typically the highest rated team in baseball, um, that their viewership is down twenty six percent. It's super shocking. Yeah. And what it says to me is that maybe these injuries are is impacting um, viewership. Because I, I'm thinking about Alex Rodriguez. When A-Rod was with the Yankees, the Yes Network was getting record-breaking um, ratings. Because you want to see the superstar. I'm thinking about myself. When I'm, when I'm cooking or cleaning or whatever I'm doing, playing with my kids, if Aaron Judge comes up to bat, I stop what I'm doing and I'm watching the game. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. but there was a period there where there wasn't any star power on this team. It was a lot of, you know, unexpected performances from guys like DJ LeMahieu and Gio Urshela, Urshela and Domingo Herman and so on and so forth. Those guys are good players, but they don't draw viewers in. So my, I think that that's why the viewership was down so, so much for the Yankees. Yep. But I just, I, I can understand that argument if you guys were missing star power and like, even if you were second place to the Red Sox or something. You were second yeah. place to the Rays. Even if you were just like five games out, two games, three games, whatever. As long as you weren't in first place, I could kind of understand why viewership would be down. You know, Yankee fans demand excellence. Right? Mm-hmm. It's not the best. You don't want it, right? So I could understand if they were second place, but they've been in first place almost all year, you know? And like they beat, they beat up the Red Sox every sure time did. until – they beat up the Red Sox every time until we, we played in Fenway, which I read. I, I, I saw this article before that Fenway series. But the point is that it doesn't make sense, man, because you guys were in first place in the AL East, killing teams left and right, still hitting home runs at the same rate. You might break your team's home run record this year still. So I kind of I'm confused as to like, you know, I, I didn't think that I think I thought the Yankees were always above the superstar, you know, above the superstars fame type of thing i thought it was all about just give me a good team put a good team out on the field and we're gonna come sell out the stadium every night because we're we're winning we're we're gonna win 90 something games this year you know so i'm i'm really surprised of that big drop off five percent ten percent yeah but 26 percent yeah that's the crazy. other thing the other thing i'm thinking too the 26 percent i i have no explanation for but the other thing i'm thinking too is could it be that people cutting cable is impacting this like do mlb tv numbers count in this uh in this in this survey i know that i know that the more people i talk to the more people i see that are starting to cut cable even even i'm considering cutting cable because i barely watch tv i watch hbo go or netflix or hulu or something like that and i never watch cable television anymore um so maybe that's another excuse i don't know i'm not sure man yeah just thought it was hopefully, interesting. Hopefully it doesn't mean that people aren't watching baseball anymore. Because that would suck. I can't. For the game. I don't know. I feel like baseball is better than ever. and It's alive with everything I, I see agree, on, on social media. So I think baseball is fine, man. I, I would hate to see some crazy changes being made just because they think people aren't watching anymore. Like, if they're not doing the research to find out how many people online are streaming games and stuff, then... And they, that's why all these random changes are, are on their way. Uh, I would hate for that to be the reason because I think baseball's fine the way it is. I, I agree that baseball, for me, in my opinion, baseball's better than ever. It's more entertaining than it's ever been for me. Um, a lot of teams are in, are in the hunt. Like, there are teams that are tanking, that, that are, you know, that it's clear that they're tanking. The Baltimore Orioles, the Detroit Tigers. That kind of sucks for, that mar- for those markets. But when I look at the, the National League playoff race, a lot of teams are in it. You know what I'm saying? Like you got the 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 Braves, the Phillies, the Nats, the the whole, the whole NL Central is technically in it still. You got the I think the Diamondbacks are at 500 again. They're in the playoff on the Dodgers. The Dodgers. I can't talk today. 
Um, even in the American League, the Cleveland Indians are threatening to take the Central away from Minnesota Twins, and they were, you know, they were way behind them not too long ago. They gave the up A's, you know, the Texas Rangers were playing good for a while. It's been a good season, and there's a lot of players that that are easy to root for in Major League Baseball. I just think that baseball has to do a better job marketing itself. You know, yep. I think that base that baseball is a very it's almost like like the dorks that watch I shouldn't say that, but anyway, the dorks that watch like Marvel movies, like they're loyal to the Marvel movies. That reminds me watch, that, yep. that reminds me of baseball. Like like baseball fans are very loyal to their teams and are loyal to their sport, but we have to find a way to attract the guy or the girl who isn't into superhero movies. You know what I mean? Um Yeah. We're super good at attracting our own people. We're not good at stepping out of our own, you know, comfort zone and bringing other people in. Yep. That's all I, I got totally to say agree, about man. that. All right. I, I, think that's I don't even know what else to add, man. You took you said everything great. Thank you. Thanks, man. Don't know what Thanks. else to add. All right, non-baseball related stuff. So uh, before we move into, we want to talk about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I watched it. And then we also went to a, a movie screening for a movie called Skin. So I want to talk about that a little bit. But before that, I just want to give you another recommendation, CT, because my TV watching now consists of we put the kids to bed. It's about 9, 930, let's say. And we'll watch something that's about an hour in length. So maybe it's a, an episode of barry or an episode of the walking dead or i'll watch a documentary or a movie or something like that we started watching two days ago a documentary on hbo called i love you now die the commonwealth versus michelle carter and it's about i don't know if you heard about this it's, a, it's about the case of this these two high school kids their yeah, boyfriend and girlfriend and they have a texting relationship it's all online and the kid is i guess he's suicidal and he, he says that he's going to kill himself and the girl, Michelle Carter, from what we what we were told from the media and so on and so forth, was that she encouraged him to get back to to when he was trying to back out of killing himself. She told him um, to get back in the car. He had bought a generator, put it inside the car, turned it on, and he was going to inhale carbon monoxide so he can die. And don't tell me that was. The, yeah. Don't tell me that's not what happened. Don't tell me that so, it, it was all. So that Boy, is actually, what happened. That is no what spoilers. happened. I don't, don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it. All right, that is all right. that is that is essentially what happened. That is like the the deal. But but people were saying that she was texting him during this time. That's not true. Um, th they were texting, but when he got out of the car, he called her. He didn't text her. Um, but the news was reporting that she texted him to get back in the car. That's not true. And there's no record of what was said in that phone conversation. So we don't know if she said, don't go back in the car or don't do this or whatever. So that's one miscon common misconception that the movie um, kind of corrects. There's also a lot of things about mental health in the movie with, with the, the boyfriend and the girlfriend. And by the end of the movie, I don't want to give anything away. By the end of the movie... Um, I kind of walked away with a change of heart. Like, I, I don't know if I was a member of the jury. I don't know if I could have convicted her and sent her to prison. Um, was she so convicted? I forgot. She was, yeah. So she's, she's serving, wow. I think, a, like 15 months or something like that. Wow. Um, so that's that's... I thought it was really good because it, it really laid the case out. It's in two parts. Part one lays out the, the case for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And part two lays out the case for Michelle Carter. And when you see her point of view of things, she, she doesn't talk in the movie. It's, it's a lot of text messages and other people talking. You kind of say to yourself, like, there's something there was something wrong with this girl. Like, there's there's something there. And th their relationship isn't as simple as it's portrayed for us on the news and on the newspapers and shit like that. So I love you now die. It's on HBO. I, I was, I was hooked. I loved it. So, I mean, loved it is not a good, you know, it's about death and shit. You know what I mean? It was good. It was well, <laughs> well made. Documented. Well made. Well documented. Yes. 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 I got to figure out a time to watch all this thing, these things, uh, make a list or, uh, okay. I'll go back and listen. Okay. <laughs> Love you now, I'll die. On, I'll put it I up did on. Watch uh, yeah. 
I did watch Interstellar after you told me to watch it. And I did watch The Wolf of Wall Street after you told me to watch it. Oh, so. Wolf of Wall Street, man. Classic. Yeah. Classic. Speaking of classics. Yeah. Did you find yourself <laughs> watching a classic over the weekend? Or? Oh, right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so last week I went to go see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino's ninth film. Um, and I wrote a piece for it on, on WTTSpod.com. You guys can go check out my review. I don't want to spoil anything, especially for you, CT. I'm not sure if you're going to go watch it. But for me, this movie and uh, Jackie Brown, which was his third film, are the most different Tarantino movies in his entire catalog or whatever you want to call it. It's, it doesn't fit the profile of a typical Tarantino movie. Yeah. You have when, a question? Did, when did the – what was the other Jackie Brown you said? Jackie Brown. They came out like around 97, 98. What's that about? It's about uh, Jackie Brown. She's a woman who had gone to prison for, I think she was smuggling drugs. And then she gets she gets out and she gets caught in a in another situation. And she has to choose between her freedom or I think it was like ratting somebody out or something like that. But it, it, Samuel L. Jackson is in it. Robert De Niro is in it um it's a really good movie pam greer yeah. it's it's good um but anyway they're the they're the two most different movies because they don't fit his kind of his mold in a way um with once upon a time in hollywood the first two-thirds of the movie felt like it almost felt like a like a documentary reenactment of 1969 like it was it was in the middle of a culture shift in the united states of america uh, the Vietnam War was being fought. The the '60s culture was kind of going out the out the window, and the new hippie culture was kind of taking over. Charlie Manson is is on the loose with his cult and all this shit. So that was kind of what the first two thirds of the movie was about. And then the last third, it all of a sudden switches into a recent Tarantino movie. There's a lot of gore, revisionist history, uh, comedy, and it's it's unique in that way. I feel like I have to watch it again because when I when I left, I said to my wife, I was like, that's not what I expected. Like, like I was kind of disappointed a little bit, but I kind of don't want to feel that way because I love Tarantino so much. Um, and I did like the way it was shot and everything. It just felt like the story didn't flow. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm going to have to watch it, man. I'm, damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. And and the ending upset some people because there is some revisionist history in it. Um, but if you just take take the real life situation, the Sharon Tate situation with with Charlie Manson. I don't know if you're familiar with that CT. If you're not, I can tell you. Yep. Um, and just remove yourself from that situation and just kind of watch it for what it is. It's an it's a movie that's supposed to be entertaining, and and it delivers in that aspect. It delivers. It's definitely entertaining. So. I, I liked it, but I want to watch it again. Yeah, I'm probably going to try to watch it before next week. Yeah. Just to... It's it's also long, man. So. Oh, man. See, why'd you have to go and say that? Sorry, man. It's like two and a half hours. I, re- no, I really got to plan this out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to buy myself the biggest bag of Skittles. I think I have the movie theaters, the big jug of soda, soda pop. And you got to take a leak yeah. in the middle of it. Yes. Um, anyway. And then we went to another movie. Uh, we went to the to a screening of the movie Skin. Um, yes, we did. Yes, we did. And it was quite an experience. Didn't you think, CT? Yeah, you know, I, I don't... I'm going to be honest with you. If if this movie... If I wasn't invited to this screening, I it's rare that I go see a movie that's related to this type of stuff uh, on my own. Because, like, when I go to the movie theater, I want to see something, like comedy or you want to be i don't know like action comedy yeah this movie was more along the lines of like race the racial issues that we're dealing with yeah. in this country so it was definitely an experience uh it went by pretty quick i'm not gonna lie i didn't feel like we were sitting through a two and a half hour once upon a time in hollywood movie <laughs> <laughs> and i think this uh, was like it, two plus hours it was it i think so Wow. See, I'd be, I'd be, I would have, I'm surprised it was more than two hours. So that tells you what you got to know about the movies. You're, you're going to be into it. Uh, it does 
get a little uncomfortable at times Mm -hmm. because of what they end up doing. But, you know, I would recommend that you go watch it. And it is highly relatable to what a lot of people are going through right now in the USA. So right in time for that election. It's exactly two hours long, CT. Wow. So not expect that. I I so this this is the kind of movie that I probably would go and watch because I'm a dork and um What is dorky first, about this? I don't know. I love watching movies. Yeah, but I but mean I like my, watching movies too. I know, but it's like But I wouldn't instead, I'm not, I wouldn't go instead of the, going out instead of going out, I prefer the movies. You know what I mean? I to a certain point do too, but I I'm split on going to watch a movie at the theaters versus watching a movie from the comfort of my home. home. Yeah, I'm okay. kind of getting split. And anyways, back to what you're saying. I'm sorry. Gotcha. Um, when I <laughs> entering it, I, I was kind of picturing American History X. I don't know if you watched that movie before, but clips, it's kind of yeah. it's kind of similar in tone that it's about a neo Nazi who wants to leave that life and has some struggles doing that. Um, it's that in that in that respect, it's similar. Um, however, the difference is that this and I'm not sure if American History X is is based on a true story. This is based on a true story of a uh, of a man named Brian Widener and a African American man who has dedicated his life to trying to change people's minds about the way they feel about race. His name is Daryl Jenkins, and they were both in attendance at the screening, which was kind of cool to see that. Um, mm-hmm. So was the director and, and a few of the actresses that were in the movie. And um, if I'm, if I'm being 100% honest, I felt like there was too much story to tell and there wasn't enough time to tell it. Like, yeah, like the transition for, for Brian Widener from the, the devout white supremacist to the guy that wants to leave the life and is like, like just completely a good person, a hundred percent good person, which I believe that that's what he is today. Yeah, I felt like the transition didn't feel natural to me, but I, but I don't blame it on the director. I don't blame it on the screenwriter. I think I think this is too big of a story for two hours, um, and I kind of wish that they had focused on either his his efforts to protect his family when, once he leaves, or or just the conversion part of it. But I felt like they were trying to fit in a love story, a human story, a friendship story, and uh, I need to protect my family, you know, action type story. You know what I'm saying? No, Um, yeah. Make a great point. Like like you said, either you're right. Even though it was two hours, I felt like we needed a, a little bit more warming up to him transitioning. Yeah. Or we also needed if the reason he transitioned, if you watch the movie, the reason he you could say he transitions is because he loves those kids, I guess. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, a little more of that showing us just how he got to that point. Right. Um, that would have definitely made the story flow, flow nicer. But yeah, or even even his friendship with the with the with Daryl, you know, that, that would have been better to have included more of that. Right. Know? Right. So, I mean, if that if if there's a uh, a criticism, that's my only criticism. Other than that, I thought that it was well shot. I thought it was well acted. Um, I thought that the story is super relevant. And I think that this is a movie that a lot of people should go out and watch because um, the executive producer, who's actually a friend of, of my wife's family, Peter Soboloff and his son, um, Mike Soboloff, they so before the movie started, Peter came out and he told he he spoke to the audience and said how uh, over seventy percent of homicides committed in the United States of America are committed by um, by neo Nazi white supremacist groups. I didn't know that fact. I mean, I knew that I knew that the number was high. I didn't know that it was the vast majority of of crimes being committed. Yeah. And I think that's important to know because anytime you turn on the news, I don't want to turn this into a race issue, CT, even though the movie is about race. Anytime you turn on the TV or you hear about a crime being committed, it's always an African-American guy or it's always a Latino guy. or And I don't know if it's because of where we live or whatever. Um, I know that I live right now where I live currently is pre- predominantly a Caucasian. It's a white 
place and I turn on the local news and I, all I see is black and, and Hispanic people being accused of committing crimes, which I'm sure they have, but we don't hear about all the other ones. And one of the, the telling things was Daryl Jenkins, who was played by Mike Coulter, the guy who's in, um, he's in Luke Cage. He came out and said that, that the biggest area for neo-Nazis and white supremacist groups was in the New York, New Jersey area. And you don't, so how come we don't hear about crimes committed by them? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's um, crazy. You hear, I don't, again, I don't want to turn this into Trump. You, you hear Trump talk about Mexicans being rapists and criminals and all the drug, all the gangs and all this shit. Why don't we hear about this stuff? You know what I'm saying? And I think, I think that, that was a big takeaway for a lot of people. Um, I know I spoke to some people after the movie and they were surprised to hear that fact. Um, so yeah, I think it's an important movie to watch. I think it's it's it, it sends a really strong message, um, and yeah, that was my takeaway. Yeah, I had a good time. Uh, it, it was cool seeing part of the cast and and the true life stories, the, the people that it was really based off of. Um, like he's like like we said, go watch it. Have a have a. Uh, a stomach for it, I guess, to just sit there and accept that this this really does happen in real life, and I hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, and and also uh, taking away like removing myself from all the negative. Also, keep in mind that there's people out there like Daryl Daryl Jenkins, and there's people out there like Brian Widener who are doing something about it. That they're they're helping people to change. And Brian Widener is an example of a of a person who went from being like I said, a devout racist into a person who wants to make a difference in society now. Like, that's an important takeaway, too. Um, people can change. I feel like we live in a world now where we're all in our corners and we're, we're in our echo chambers. Our friends on Twitter only have to agree with everything that I say. Our friends on Facebook only agree with what I say. Um and we don't take the time to listen to each other and and try to change some minds anymore. And I think that that's something that's missing in our society. And uh, and yeah, vote for Manny twenty twenty for president. I would. If you really were running. <laughs> I, don't I would do it. Would. I would. Wa- I wouldn't waste the vote, but if I'm the only one voting for you, then yeah, I kind of wasted that vote. <laughs> um. So that's all I got, man. Hey. It was a crazy day. Let's not forget. It was trade a crazy deadline. day. I feel like there's so much more that we didn't talk about, maybe. I'm not sure, but. You know what? Shout out to. Let me just. Are we wrapping it up or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Bo Bichette for getting called up to the major leagues. Right. Nobody probably. What took even... so long, man? No, what took so long? I, the last thing I read was that he'll definitely be in consideration for 2020. And the next thing I know, they're calling him up. So, uh, oh, I don't know if you care about this, but I actually thought it was a pretty random trade uh eric sogard going from the blue jays to the rays i thought they yeah. called up eric sogard and got rid of kevin pilar so that he can play outfield well and then I they called the, i guess the, the blue jays must have decided all right whatever let's just bring up bichette now but what happens to to the years of control that whole shit like are they going to try to send them down at some point so that they get another year out of them i still don't know how that works but i i thought that the whole year thing was the, all they had to do was play 12 games down in the minors oh. their rookie year i think so i think that's what gives them that extra year of control because everybody that gets called up for that extra year uh they get called up like the the month that baseball yeah, yeah, starts yeah. or like the month after so i'm A thinking it has, it's something about how many it's something about how many games you have to play in the minors that season before you get well, called up I know that the way the way free agency works is based on on service time. So I wonder if if I guess what I'm trying to figure out is is he going to get credit for for service time right now? You know what I'm saying? Like, or are they going to you know take another year? I have away? a feeling that he'll know. still. I have a feeling he'll still be a rookie next year. But a simple Google search will fix this. But I'm not going to do it. Same here, man. We're just gonna. Same here. We're just gonna agree. We're gonna agree that he has it's fifty fifty. Either he is gonna yeah. be a rookie next year, or he's not. So <laughs> we're I not agree, gonna man. Google this shit. I'm with you, man. Ah, uh, man. Uh, another one random. Corey Dickerson going to the mm-hmm. from the Pirates to the 
Was it the Rays? Did he go to the Rays? I don't even know. Uh, I'm a baseball fan. I, I will tell you shortly. You know what? No, I'm not going to tell you. We don't fact check here. Corey Dickerson went somewhere, guys. All right. Corey Dickerson went to the... Wow, a lot of trades were made in the last 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Man, I'm just... Oh, Drew Pomerantz to the Brewers. I didn't even see this one. Shout out to Drew Pomerantz. I heard about Pom. Pomeranz, but I didn't know he went to the Brewers. Tanner Roark to the A's. The A's are random, man. They they're oh, getting that, guys, but they're not getting anything. <laughs> that kind of that kind of brings me to a point that I wanted to make, make about the Yankees, and I swear this isn't going to take long. But if the Yankees decide that they're not going to start moving some of these these pieces and try to get someone that could potentially put them over the hump, they're what what they're starting to resemble is an expensive version of the of the Oakland A's. A team who knows how to develop players, a team who's strong on analytics, a team that's not going to fall below 500, a team that might make the postseason most of the time, but a team that never wins a World Series. And that shit does not fly in New York. So, Brian Cashman, levántate, get that cafe bustelo, and let's get some fucking work done. God damn. Quick question. So, Corey Dickerson went to the Phillies. Shane Green went to the Braves. I'm looking at the list here, and all it says, assets received for Shane Green. It says for the Tigers to be determined, determined. and same thing, same thing for the Pirates. Now, for the Pirates, I know I saw to be determined, a player to be named later. How does that work? I guess they say we agree it, to trade, but we don't, we don't know who, who we're going to so trade the Pirates, for. So, so, the Phillies could go on and, and you know— have Corey Dickerson for the rest of the year. But the what, did the Pirates just kind of say, hey, like, we got this guy. He's not in our top 100, but he's great. He'll go great with you guys. Like, take him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that works. Maybe they and have, Corey, maybe they have players in Corey Dickerson is a good player, man. He, Corey Dickerson decent. is a good player. Yeah, he's yeah. decent. You don't know what he'd be like on a, on a good team, like a good lineup like the Phillies now. We'll see. But I'm just, I'm always, <laughs> I need to one day just sit down and look up how waiver wires used to work. Uh, players to be announced, players to be determined works, cash considerations. I know cash considerations is probably simple enough, but st- still, like, aren't aren't these, like, pennies to millionaires at this point? You know what I'm trying cash to figure out? That, that Scooter Jeanette trade, he was just traded for cash. They didn't get any players in return. And last year, he batted, like, 330. He's a decent player. I don't know. I'm not sure He's what good. exactly the Reds are, are and doing And they traded here. for Bauer. That's what I'm trying they to say. To, I don't. I don't know what's going on. I don't know, man. I mean, but if the Dietrich Reds, has been the Reds good be this tra- season, yeah, um, they could have traded Dietrich. Yeah, but Dietrich, Dick, whatever the hell, Dick, Dickrich, um, Double D. I don't know what they're thinking. Joey Votto is a year older. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I what I what I think is going to happen is I think Bauer is going to move in the off season again because he's making 13 million dollars now. Uh, he's got this. He's entering his last year of arbitration, so he's gonna make more money. They're not gonna want to pay him that, so Bauer's going somewhere else, guaranteed in the off season. Um, but I don't get. I, I, they must have been planning on flipping him and didn't and and didn't get what they wanted, so that they just decided to hold on to him. That's that's the only explanation for that. That trade makes no sense to me whatsoever. Man, the the Diamondbacks got Seth Beer, Corbin Martin, which Corbin Martin is probably the most notable one out of the bunch. Josh Rojas, I haven't heard too much about him, and JB Bukowskis. Okay, four guys, four guys for a thirty-five-year-old Zach Greinke, <laughs> some of the highest-paid pitchers, <laughs> that, players. Fucking Astros, man! I hope they lose. Man, I hope they Astros. lose. I hope I hope the Astros have the best work record in the American League. I hope they face off against the wild card team. And I hope they lose. That's what I hope happens. Jesus, man. That's I mean, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? All right. I think- oh, I just saw th- I just saw this one. I and this guy's on my fantasy team, Zach Gallon to the to the Diamondbacks. That's I don't weird. understand half of these moves. Zach Zach Gallon is like was like a nobody at the beginning. He wasn't even on the forty man roster. Hmm. And he's come up and he's pitched well. He's actually pitched pretty good. He had a great start yesterday. Uh I'm but it just tells you what the value of this guy. He he was the best pitcher in the minors this year. He's come up. He's pitched well in the majors. You didn't even get a notification when Zach Allen got traded. Hmm. Come on, Let's, man. Um, show, this guy some, show this guy some love. 
let me let me do let me do a sign off real quick ct and then i i let's talk for like five more minutes about fantasy and just put it at the very end of the episode all right sounds, sounds like a plan sounds like a plan all right everybody the welcome to the show podcast is independently produced by me manny gomez and ct aka luis gomez help people find our show by taking two minutes to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to your podcast it helps people to find our show also, don't forget to visit audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show to get your free audio book download and a 30 day free trial. That's audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show. CT. Peace out. Peace. <laughs> All right, so this is our our extra extra five minutes max CT on 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 our fantasy league. This this has to be in the how many years have we done this? Five years. Is this five. the fifth season? In the fifth year of of this league, this has to be the best season ever so far, don't you think? Could be. I mean CT. Are you there? You're listening, CT. Out of I'm the listening. twelve, out of the twelve teams in contention, nine of them have hopes of mm-hmm. making the postseason. I I would say that only three teams are have officially been eliminated. Um, one team has a, a slim chance of making it, and then there's eight teams that are in serious contention of of making the postseason. And I don't mm-hmm. think we've ever had a season like that. There's always been teams that are just way above and beyond better than anybody else. And then there's teams that just never stood a chance. Like last year, I was eliminated by halfway through the season. You know what I'm saying? Um, last year, I started off 0-4. And I I just, I didn't, I didn't accept that. I didn't accept that, man. And let me say something else, man. Now, are we just free to talk fantasy? Is it just a five-minute free-for-all? Before you start talking fantasy, I started the season 0-4 too. I started the okay, season. there we go. I started the season one and six, CT. Okay. One and six. Okay. And since then, that wasn't a kiss. I was just sucking my lips. Um, and since then, it. one and six, I've gone seven and two, and I'm in the. I'm officially in the playoffs. Um, so, I just want to take a moment for you guys to appreciate my greatness. Knowing ahead, the his, knowing the history between you and fantasy, why would you? Toot your horn the way you just well, did. Well, because the Fuku is here already. He's already <laughs> with me. Half of my team was on the day-to-day <laughs> yesterday. Um, I lost fucking Dansby Swanson is injured. Um, you know? So, I don't know. I mean, back to what you said about this being the best season. Yeah, this has been the most exciting season this late. But I don't, I don't care, man. I have my oh eyes my focused on one thing. All my brain power is focused on one thing. And I feel like the Red Sox are suffering because of it. <laughs> I really wanted them. I really wanted uh, them to beat the Yankees over the weekend, and they did. They came through for me. They did one for me. But let me let me tell you what's annoying about fantasy, which is not I shouldn't even complain because this is just me being greedy. But Herman Marquez, what do you think about Herman Marquez? I I think he's a decent pitcher, but he he plays in course field. So I wouldn't take a chance on a guy like that. So I think Herman Marquez is underrated, right? I don't, I don't even know the numbers, but I think he's underrated. Today he goes. Cindergard or Marquez? The... Cindergard or Marquez? Wow. Uh... Well, I'm taking Marquez since I drafted him over. I would have wow. drafted him over Cindergard. He's up there. Offensive. I'm sorry, man. Cindergard is cool and everything, but I think he needs he needs to do more. Okay. Anyway, and this continue. is coming from a Red Sox. Anyways. Uh, I think Herman Marquez is pretty good, underrated. He goes six innings today, two hits, no walks, 10 strikeouts against the Dodgers. Did he play day away? To day. day to day. Did he, <laughs> is, did he pitch away or in Coors Field? He, he pitched at Coors Field. Really? No way. 20, against the Dodgers? 20, 28 points, but 
as the fantasy as the fantasy gods giveth, they taketh away, man. Because now he's day to day, and I cannot, I can't, I can't deal with them, man. Especially well, since you know, people don't want to trade with me. You know what I say, CT? Winners don't complain. Winners win. Rule number fifty six. What is it? Uh, play like a champion. I can't remember what the first line is. Sure, man. Whatever. That's Just what let saying. me. I just found out which is why I'm taking this. Listen, guys, I've taken this I've taken this approach this season where I literally would would, if if Fuku stood in front of me, I'd spit in his face and I'd fucking uppercut him and then I'd take a a shit on his fucking stomach. I'm just insulting his ass. Because he can't he can't tear me down anymore. It's been too long. This is my year, guys. So if you want, here's your opportunity. You can just Throw in the towel. I'll take two fifty from the pot, and I'll distribute the rest back to you guys. I'll split it evenly. I don't even want this? all the money. What is this? Huh? We're we're admitting failure. What are we doing? I'm saying if you want to throw in the towel, I'll only take half of the pot, and I'll give you guys half back. <clears throat> Let me make something clear. Yeah. I have a game winning RBI in place right now. If the Twins can just hold on, mm-hmm. let me make something very clear, Manny. I would never. <laughs> throw in the towel okay and i i'm 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 still gonna win it all this year i don't know why people don't see that i mean look at what my team has been through and look at the games that i win and people don't score against me what you think that's gonna change in the playoffs like okay all right i have i have a top three point scored team and a bottom two points al- points allowed team give me your I... give me your give me your schedule and i'd be like 13 and one Son. I have the fifth most points scored, and I'm the least scored against. But let me tell you something. That's why I came out with the <laughs> Avocado Award, because you guys wouldn't stop being, oh, but I scored the most, and I wish I played. <laughs> now you guys got the Avocado Award. Do you guys rack up those Avocado Awards and <laughs> leave the leave the trophy for the real championship, real okay. champion. And I'll, I think I'll, this this hasn't even been a fantasy talk. It's been more just like trash talk at this point. I know. I know. But that's fine. Man. But, but, but um. I'll tell you one thing, who we have to watch out for, the Mobes is back. And I think yeah. that he's Paul Goldschmidt all of a sudden is fucking Mark McGuire. I, I wonder if he's consulting or something. Yep. Um, but you know who I'm not afraid of, though, is that Diego character. Got a pretty good team, though. Yeah, he's all right. Overrated, he's been pretty, in my opinion. He's been pretty, he's been pretty consistent, man. The Green Monsters has sixty eight hundred points. Yo, he scored he's seven hundred. He scored five hundred points, I think, like four times this year. Yeah. His, his got team the, is just insane, man. He got the high motor. And it's and but it's you know, all because of you know what, Diego, I take it back. I'm sorry. It's all because of the absolute worst team in fantasy, DC Deathstroke. Who the fuck trades Will Myers? For Charlie Blackman. I mean, fuck. I don't know, man. Charlie Blackman since then has been, <laughs> he, he's like top five in points. Just, just to let Charlie, you put it in perspective where he started off and now he's what he is, man. It's Charlie Blackman. He's he's a top five point scorer in fantasy every season. But every think season. About the, but think about the luck to trade away a guy like Charlie Blackman and then to pick up Josh Bell in, in oh free agency. Oh, my God. Like, think of the luck. The the trade. How did, how did we allow him to trade Will Myers for Charlie Black? He wouldn't even be in playoff contention if it wasn't for that trade. I don't know, man. You're right. I think I, think I totally agree with what you're saying, man. We got a lot of false positives over here. And and if the whole league was here, I'd ask us all to say in unison, "You're welcome to DC Deathstroke. You're welcome, Ivy." Even though I wasn't the yeah. one that traded fucking Charlie Blackman for Will Myers, even though I wasn't the one that dropped Josh Bell, Jesus fucking Christ! I fucking dropped Eduardo Escobar, man, because Thanks, I, man. I held him. I, I held on to him for a while though. Thank you. He wasn't doing. He wasn't doing shit for me. Anyways, let's wrap this up. I, <laughs> I got 3.3 average points out of him per night. 356 yeah. points. Thanks. Thank you. And you officially no, won the I, bottle trade. I mean, he's not even... I don't know what to tell you. He's, he's not even doing crazy. 
Yeah, but he's, you know, Fultonavich is still in AAA, and there's no indication. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped him. There's no indication that they're planning on ever bringing him back up. You dropped him? I dropped him. He's been sitting on my fucking bench just taking up a, a spot. I picked up a reliever. <laughs> I, got a, I think I got a reliever out of it. They should allow you to put guys in AAA in the IL or like in a AAA slot or something. That's Maybe we could work something out. Maybe we could work something out. That's a good idea. We should. I'm telling you, man, we should try to start a campaign. I said this last episode to become MLB commissioners and then we can create our own fantasy, le- uh, our own fantasy system done the right way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Damn. But, but it's going to it's up to you, the listener, to help us get there. All right. Yeah, if we get enough listeners to get a following and then we start paying players. Right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So what we've learned here today, guys, is that I'm going to win the chip and uh, the offer still stands. If you guys want to, you know, I'll take half the money and I'll give you guys half back. You can instead of walking away with zero, you can walk away with twenty five bucks, guys. Think about it. Um, Think about it. Let me know. I'm never banging down. Okay. All right, guys. It's kind of hot. It's kind of hot in this rhino. (laughs) (laughs) This jersey is pretty hot. (laughs) Word. All right. Make these. Why do they make jerseys out of this? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Supposed to. Supposed to be made out of cotton. It's made out of whatever the fuck. Velour. I try to read that. There's no way I could have read that. (laughs) All right, CT. All right, man. Peace.